Good morning, students. Um, this part of the lecture focuses on ecology, and ecology happens to cover uh, five different uh, chapters, chapters 26 all the way through chapter 30. And the focus of today's lecture mainly um, is to concentrate on two questions. How does a population size change? And how is population growth regulated? So let's begin. When we talk about uh, ecology, what we're really referring to is the study of interrelationships of organisms with each other and their non-living environment. Now, um, more specifically, some of you may have learned of these terms called abiotic and biotic factors. Um, if you look at this particular diagram, there are many different levels in which ecology could be examined. You can look at it, at it from the most, from the largest scale, which is our biosphere. That includes all of the habit, uh, habitable places that are on the surface of the earth. You can then reduce it by looking at the various ecosystems that involve the flow of energy and matter, such as the water cycle, the nitrogen cycle, and the oxygen cycle that you may have already learned. Then if you break it back, if you break it down into uh, different regions um, and geography, you can then look at the interactions among the different groups of organisms and how they interact with one another, including uh, what the natural resources that are available or unique to that particular population, to those particular populations. Then we can also study the individual populations as well as the individual species um, and how they change uh, in terms of population size and development of traits over time, which is what we had kind of been looking at in terms of the studies of evolution prior to this particular unit. All right, so now, Let's take a look at uh, what are some of the factors and processes that are affecting the population size. Population size is a result um, of natural increases and net migration. Now by natural in processes, what I am referring to are births and death rates. How often, how many babies are born, how many um, organisms are passing away. Net migration revolves to how many organisms are moving into or out of a particular region. Uh, if you're talking about um, uh, immigration, then what we're looking at is patterns in which large groups of organisms um, are leaving a particular terrain in in search for natural resources that they need. And as you know, certain types of organisms, um, they grow in herds and then they also travel from one place to another based on seasonal changes. So based on this definition, under what circumstances do you expect uh, population size to change? Well, as a population grows, uh, that is when the sum of the natural increase and that migration, it's going to be positive. When a population declines, that's when the sum, it's negative. Now, by change in population, we are using this simplified formula that you see in front of you. That is natural increase plus net migration. So you take the birth rate, subtract it, um, 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 subtract the death rate. Then you take the number of immigration from, subtracted from the number of immigration. It's the combined effect of the natural birth processes and the movement patterns of these groups of organisms that we use to determine how much is a population size for a given species changing over time. Now, what factors can cause a population size to fluctuate? Um, well, there are a number of different things. Um, if you think about all the different types of organisms that we are familiar with, not all organisms can reproduce year round. Some of them mate and reproduce at specific seasons uh, throughout the year. This can apply to both plants and animals. For example, this time of year is what we call springtime. And for many of us who have allergies, what we're really sensitive to are the pollens that are being released by trees and plants. Um, and uh, if you are animal lovers, you may be familiar um, with some of the organisms that are considered as monoesterous versus polyesterous. What does that mean? Some organisms are only able to mate with another organism sexually um, during very specific times throughout the year, and it only happens uh, once. Um, and examples of that could be like the panda bear. 
which only has a very strict reproductive cycle that only happens within a very narrow window of about 24 hour um, 24 hours within a particular time period that lasts uh, where they are most fertile with another organism. Now, other organisms um, would have a polyester cycle, which means that they can mate multiple times throughout the year, but their cycle will be interrupted temporarily if they get pregnant. And then they go into a cycle of what we consider as dormancy. So let's take a look at what I mean by that. Here's a chart that shows some of the common animals that you and I are familiar with. Uh, the cow, a female sheep, female bear, and also a female horse. Now, all of these organisms have different lengths in the estrus cycle where their hormonal levels are ready to um, participate in sexual reproduction and getting ready for pregnancy. And then if they do get pregnant, there's a length of time where they will not be ready to receive and become preg impregnated by or develop another young. So these cycles would affect their reproductive capabilities and reproductive patterns, which then drives and contributes towards the overall population size. Here's another um, uh, example. Oops, sorry, I, don't, I guess I don't have that, um, that we can take a look at. It's the reproductive rate per species. The reproductive rate per species refers to how many youngs an organism can produce. Some organisms, like insects, can, re can produce as many as 200 offsprings um, in a cluster. But then there are other ones that can only produce one young per at a time because they are going to be pro providing parental care but some species don't. So that also significantly fluctuates the numbers and range and size of the population. The stability of environmental conditions also matters. For example, based on the location of various populations, are they close in contact with the type of natural resources that they need, such as food, such as water, access to sunlight? Um, which part of the tropical rainforest do they live in? Or are they in the Arctic region or in the temperate environment. The environment that they're living in, um, the space that they need in order to stay alive, have they been affected by human impact, such as urbanization, deforestation, or would they be lucky enough to be living in an area um, where there is conservation effort? Is there a presence, absence, or an abundance of predators that are going to be preying on them? That also affects um, how long a particular population size can be sustained uh, within a given period of time. Are there new diseases or a persistent disease that they're having trouble getting rid of? And are there new invasive species that was introduced into the environment? You see, all of these things come into factor in a natural setting, a very, which is very different from when you and I uh, set up an artificial uh, simulation environment in the laboratory where we're trying to track and look at each of these things. But let's, let's carry on and look at it a little bit more. So how do you measure growth rate within a particular population? The growth rate of a population is the percentage change in a population size per unit of time. So that is actually measured by using this particular formula where we use the letter R to represent the growth rate and we take the number of death rate subtracted from the number of birth rate, right? So as long as the number of babies that are being born exceeds the number of individuals that are dying, then your population size is increasing. But on the other hand, if the, if the death rate far exceeds or outpaces the number of babies born, then the population size would then be decreasing. Now, this has a different effect on a population that has a who naturally produces a lot of baby or versus those that only produce one at a time. So the overall population growth equals the growth rate, which is the formula indicated right here above, multiply by N, which represents the original population size that you had to begin with. All right, so let's take a look at some examples. If the birth rate far exceeds the death rate, by significant number, then it enters into a phase, what we call exponential growth. That refers to an ever larger number that is added to population during each succeeding time period. 
So what can lend itself to expect exponential growth, where the population size is exploding, as what this term is inferring? inferring. That is where each individual produces more than one offspring that will wound up being able to survive long enough so that they then go on to reproduce and have their offspring. It also has to do with the age of the first reproduction. Now, some organisms uh, have bodies that can mature as quickly as they are born, and then they can engage in sexual reproduction um, or begin to reproduce on their own altogether. But then there are also organisms that takes a very long period of time before they can mature um, and be able to carry a young, such as humans, for instance. We go through a long phase um, before we reach um, puberty, adolescent years, and then that's when um, reproduction can begin. Now, exponential growth uh, occurs um, when you have this fast pacing of, um, of reproduction. Let's take this particular example um, to consider. Supposedly, there are two populations of golden eagles, and we track them for uh, 30 years. In individuals in one population begin to reproduce at the age of four, while individuals in another population of golden eagles begin, doesn't begin to reproduce until they reach the age of six. So the difference is only two years, right, that we're looking at. Which one of these two would you expect to have reached exponential growth faster? Which one will be slower? You probably have an idea already, so let's take a look at what it looks like graphically. This is what it would look like. The red line represents the, um, the golden eagles that, that can reproduce at four years old. And then the blue line represents those that reproduce starting at six years old. As you can see, the red line that represents the eagles that can reproduce at a younger age can rise in exponential growth at a much faster rate at 24 years, where they would reach 2,504 eagles based on the age at which they can start reproduction. Whereas on the other hand, those that start to reproduce until age six, they at, the, at 24 years has only reproduced 392 eagles altogether. Now, if you look at the scale based on a 30 year trend, there is a tenfold difference between these two population growth, even though the reproductive age is only in a difference of just two years that we're looking at. All right, isn't that, very, isn't that interesting? So now, what has to happen in order to maintain that J shape? You notice right here, each one of these uh, lines on no matter if you're looking at the red line or the blue line, it, it resembles the letter J. So we call, we say that this is a J shape curve, which is really characteristics of exponential growth. All right. Now, given what do you need to keep this population um, expanding at this rate? First of all, the birth rate must far exceed and outpace the death rate. And the amount of time that it takes for a population to reach a particular size will depend on the magnitude of death rate. So let's take a look at this last concept right here regarding death rate. Look at these three lines. It represents the effect of death rate on um, a population growth, all right? So these are bacteria that have different death rates. The green line represents that where there is no death, all right, obviously this is a hypothetical scenario. And then there is a blue line that represents 10% death rate. And then the red line represents a 25% death rate, a much higher magnitude in which they can die. So if you take a look at this, which one of these would have a bigger problem? So let's take a look. The green line, it takes about three and a half hours to produce um, 1,500 bacteria, whereas those in the blue line, it takes four hours to reproduce 1,500 bacteria. So it takes them a little bit longer uh, because they have a 10% death rate, right? That's uh, slowing them down. But then the one in the red line um, takes five and a half hours in order to reach 1,500 bacteria. For, so for the same population size, what, hap what is the impact when there is a higher death rate? Obviously, it slows down the population growth. Um, it delays it because you, it will take a longer time to replenish the number of organisms that are dying in a population in order to reach the same size over time. All right, well, what about us, human population growth? You're probably quite familiar with this graph. You've seen it in history classes and you see it in science classes and math classes as well. 
So what factors are driving this particular trend? For the longest time, human population has been quite stable over a very long extended period of time. But now it is, we are all definitely at an exponential growth. However, you are probably familiar with the concept that um, there is no way that in any given species of population that where they can grow indefinitely, where there is no end in sight. There are always factors at work. But what is allowing this to happen in the first place? Now, obviously, we have much better medical care. We have developed all sorts of medical treatments and cures for various types of diseases so that we minimize um, the chances of death rate, right? We are also getting much better at agriculture. Not only can we domesticate all kinds of plants and animals for consumption, but we'll also genetically engineer them so that they have specific traits that we need. And they can offer us various organs and drugs that we need from them as well. We have also um, been able to develop uh, better environments for ourselves. We know how to change our natural environment in order for us to put more people within a given landmass than any other organisms are capable to do. So those are a lot of those driving forces that are sustaining this. And of course, we have a social structure that's um, uh, enabling us to take care, better care of ourselves as we get older. Now, all of these both man-made infrastructures and our ability to, do, to defy um, a shorter lifespan has contributed towards this exponential growth in humans, but we will ultimately be matching, uh, meeting some of the limitations of our natural environment, such as clear, ha having access to fresh water, having access to um, real estate property because they've gotten very expensive, especially in examples like New York City. All right. Um, so all of this can have limitation on population growth in different parts of the globe. Now let's take a look at this. In general, there is something known as biotic potential, which refers to the maximum rate at which a population grow, can grow. Some of the factors that can um, have an impact on the size of a given population includes age, as we mentioned, um, in which the organism first starts reproduction. How often an organism reproduces, right? How many times a year um, and um, how long is their lifespan that enables that? Well, humans have something known as menopause as well, which can limit how long we can actually be in our prime reproductive years where we have a higher chance of creating another human being. What is the average number of offspring that is being produced each time when an, in, when an organism gets pregnant? All right, if you think about uh, cockroaches, uh, they produce a significant number. Uh, so do green sea turtles. However, the difference is that in green sea turtles, um, majority of the young uh, per cluster of each of, of about 120 eggs that where they lay, um, usually there's only one that will survive to adulthood. Um, so it, it is really, really um, uh, uh, scary. And if you're an animal lover, um, you will find that really disheartening because there are so many things that work against these turtles in order for them to grow into adulthood. And of course, the death rate of individuals um, and also the typical lifespan of that particular types of species also has a limitation to reproductive rate as well and growth. Now, here are two interesting looking graphs. So you are already familiar with the exponential growth. That's the J curve that you see here. But on the other hand, you see a very different kind of graph. This has an S shape instead. All right, it looks like the letter S. And the reason why this particular population is growing, 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 but then all of a sudden it stabilizes somewhat. Now, in reality, the line is not going to be as smooth as this. This is an uh, this is just a very simple schematic diagram to illustrate a point, and that is eventually in any given population, the group of species will be limited by what we call carrying capacity, represented by the capital letter K. Carrying capacity refers to the limits that the natural environment sets um, for a particular group of species based on limitations in the landmass that's available for them, main, namely habitat availability, um, food source availability, um, access to natural resources such as water, um, and also being able to find a mate 
especially if it involves sexual reproduction, right? All of these things come into play. And of course, when there's significant amount of overpopulation and crowding, you also have problems such as diseases that set in place much more easily, where larger set portions of a population can be eliminated. And of course, uh, there's also increased competition, which makes, which makes survival much more challenging. So that carrying capacity is what eventually would limit and or cap the size of a population and keep it along this maximum level um, where individuals can still be sustained, but at a level where the resources will not be completely depleted because exponential growth has significant negative impacts to the environment and to the populations itself. So let's take a look at this. Here's another um, hypothetical scenario where you have a population size that is growing exponentially, right? And you see this, you see this curve keep showing up, but notice, all right, as the human population size increases and surpassing the carrying capacity of our natural environment based on the resources that are available, we say that it enters into a phase that where it overshoots the carrying capacity. Eventually, whatever those factors or combinations of factors are that sets into this area, right, this time frame, the population size will begin to crash and deplete, which means that the death rate will now far exceed the number of birth rate, right? And then it will, it can, population size can decrease to a point where it goes far below the carrying capacity. Um, why? Because whatever it is that's driving the population sustaining over time, that cannot be sustained anymore. And so sometimes what can also happen is that when the population size um, increases at such a significant level, you can cause a lot of damage to the natural environment, such as water pollution, um, land mass pollution, uh, uh, pollution, and also a, um, a particular uh, disease can also set in where we can have this large scale um, number of individuals that, may, that we may be losing from our population. And it would take quite some time for this population in this represented in this uh, dotted line to go back up to a carrying capacity. Now, for certain species of organisms, um, if they really destroy the environment really badly, they may not be able to get back up to near carrying capacity because the physical environment can no longer support the number of individuals that can live in that area. Um, but in other cases, it can, uh, and it will usually hover up and down and back and forth along the carrying capacity line. I'll show you some real examples in just a moment. If you take a look at these population pyramids, which again, you're probably familiar from your history classes, right? It, it shows that for a given country, what are the age distributions in this particular area? and the ratio of male versus females. Now, why would that matter when you're looking at a population size? It's because male uh, humans perform sexual reproduction and um, they, the number of ratios of male to female will affect how likely it is where they will be able to find a mate and reproduce a young. The distribution in terms of the number of individuals um, at their prime reproductive ages, which is right around this particular category right here, these couple of lines, uh, will determine how fast our population is going to grow over time. So if you take a look at a population graph like this, you can really use it to your advantage, especially as a politician, to devise um, infrastructures and policies that can help sustain a growing population, a reducing population, um, and propose social measures that can promote one way or the other. And you can also use it to predict where some of the problems can be uh, based on the economy that's available to your country within a period of time frame. All right, now, um, how is the population growth regulated? There are a number of different things as we have indicated before, really, it's a result of an interaction between biotic potential, things that we had just mentioned, such as uh, predation, diseases, uh, food source availability, but also environmental resistance. Um, put it more plainly, it is an interaction between the non-living factors, known as abiotic factors, against um, or with 
the biotic factors, the presence of other organisms that are around us, right? Because we really do not live alone. The abiotic factors in this case would include competition among species, whether they are the same species or different species that have the similar needs. How, how good, are we, how well do we do in terms of competing for limited resources? The climatic patterns within the given area or terrain that we're living in, all right? How often are these different seasonal uh, patterns coming in and are we familiar with them or are they changing drastically over time? The presence or occurrence of natural disasters such as fires, floods, droughts, hurricanes, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, all of these things have a major impact for variety of species that we're going to be looking at. So now, what happens to a population that does exhibit exponential growth? They usually um, show what we call a boom and bust cycle. So there's a period of time where the population is struggling early on, especially if it's a species that's starting off in a new area. Um, eventually they may need a favorable growing conditions or environment, or they found a way to make it work. In any way, they may have also adaptations um, within various numbers of organisms in a given species that makes them better adapted to the environment. So those will, will then go on to reproduce more babies, allowing a boom in the population size until it reaches a certain point, or which we call it a carrying capacity. And if it exceeds it uh, far beyond what the environment can support, well, then it will enter what we call a bust cycle because all the nutrients are depleted and in this case, uh, where we're looking at a photosynthetic bacteria that grows in water, um, the water temperature is not in the right temperature range for it to sustain this population growth, so it dies. And when it dies, the numbers plummet significantly over time. This particular boom and bust cycle, um, it's quite illustrative of a familiar phenomena that we know of that we call algal bloom. What I would like you guys to do is take a look at this two-minute uh, news feed that is produced by a local television. And what they're seeing, what they're gonna be showing you are the algal bloom, which is depicted, you see this water that's colored in green? That's not natural. All of these are actually huge population growth of a type of bacteria known as cyanobacteria. When you watch the news feed, what I want you to do is to answer some of the questions that I'm gonna give you with regards to what's really going on here. And why is algal bloom such a concern throughout different parts of the United States and also in other countries too. A lot of this actually, it's due to human impact. It has a lot to do with the way we conduct agriculture and um, the way in which water systems work. So I hope that you would have fun taking a look at that. It's just a two minute video. Now, let me carry on. Um, well, how do lemmings, uh, this particular organism, exhibit exponential growth? Um, the lemming populations tend to grow until there is a lack of food or if there is large migrations or predators in the environment such that it will cause um, starvation and leads to high mortality rate. Now, their population graph is rather interesting. What you may notice right away is that um, throughout the time period where the population size will measure, you see a period where the population grows uh, at a very high point, and then it drops. And then it grows again in the, in the following, um, in the subsequent years, in the, in the similar pattern. So there's a lot of discussions regarding how, how this happens and why it happens. And it seems like it is related to the season, um, a period of time in, in the year where they probably have an abundance of food. And then when the food source goes away, the population size uh, dwindles or when there's a large, or when there are predators that are around in the environment. Here's another interesting example. So when did the uh, whooping crane population generate exponential growth? This is an interesting example uh, because the whooping crane population um, has been endangered for a significant period of time um, until they were protected by a hunting ban uh, that was introduced in the, uh, in the 1900s. In this particular case, if you look at the graph, right, uh, it looks like it's exhibiting exponential growth, except this remains to be one of the rarest birds that you can see in the world. Now, even though you may 
if you just look at the graph itself, you may think that, oh, okay, we, we probably have to do something about it because the population size is going to crash. Except if you look on the y-axis, we're talking about triple digits only. This particular organism, the, in spite of all of the effort that we have put in, it's having trouble staying alive in its natural environment. All right. So that begs the question, why? And for some of you, you may already have some ideas of your own, right? It's habitat destruction, uh, for one, um, and availability of natural resources, um, areas in which where this bird can be flying to um, may also not be intact as it used to be in the past. All of these are factors that are affecting and devastating the crane population. Now, what about invasive species? because we hear about this from time to time. These are organisms that are not natural and not native to a given environment, which means they typically do not have a natural predator. So when you introduce them to a new environment, they basically have nothing that's gonna be able to go after it um, or not interested in eating it. But what this organism can do is it can destroy the original native environment that it has invaded or it's settling in. And one of these uh, famous examples is the Asian longhorn beetle, which goes after uh, some of our trees. And it has a tendency to bore these huge holes in tree bark. Uh, and then what they tend to do is that they will go into the interior of the tree and eat the live portions of the tree, killing the, the entire tree. But usually by the time you may notice them, they would have already killed um, the plant itself. Uh, they could be found um, in parts of New York City and throughout many different parts of the United States. Um, and this particular invasive species is actually being hunted all the time by our, natural, uh, by our National Park Service uh, um, individuals because we really need to get rid of this insect that is not natural to our native environment. Now here's another one that looks quite pretty. If you've been traveling along the Hudson River or any of the major river systems, it used to be a rare sighting, but no more because this particular invasive plant species, though it looks gorgeous, known as the purple loosestrife, it is such a difficult plant to eradicate. Scientists and naturalists have spent decades trying to figure out how to get rid of this plant because once it invades a uh, open water environment, it will grow and it would uh, crowd out a lot of the native plant species and prevent the um, native animals that typically live in this water environment from, and they would get crowded out. So ducks and frogs will no longer be able to live there because of the way in which the root system and the stems, and you can see how tightly packed they are on the bottom of your screen. Uh, they are really difficult to eradicate and they have a tendency to produce millions of seeds um, whenever they flower. All right, here's a video that I would like you guys to take a look at. It only takes about eight and a half minutes. And what's really cool is they would show you footage of what um, a natural marshland or water environment, aquatic environment used to look like before the invasion of these purple loosestrife got there, got there and what happens afterwards. And what's also interesting is that it is able in this eight and a half minute video introduce you a concept known as biological control. Um, what that means is scientists have figured out one way to go after these invasive species um, is by using, utilizing its natural predators. Uh, but because this plant species is not native to the United States, it was actually dropped off, supposedly, uh, the theory is that it was probably dropped off by accident uh, by some of the uh, transports where boats have docked into some of our waterways and then this plant landed in the United States and it's, start, and it's now spread um, um, all across the US. The problem is that we have tried using chemical controls, which are not effective, not to mention it causes water pollution. Um, scientists have also tried other forms of uh, dredging where we literally dig out these plants, but then because like I said, the seeds tend to spread very easily and they are produced in such significant numbers, you can never get rid of them fast enough. Um, and dredging a water, uh, watershed uh, like a river system costs a lot of money. So what they have found is a natural predator, by the way, more than one, um, where they are very effective at uh, controlling these plants. But you know what's very interesting is that once you introduce um, um, a so-called predator, to, or in this case, a consumer for the plant, um, the consumer doesn't exactly kill 
or want to kill all of the plants. Yeah, it, it's actually a very interesting dynamic there that I want to introduce you here because it's something that we will come back to uh, later on in, our, in this particular unit on ecology. But I think it does a beautiful job in just eight and a half minutes of showing you how this actually works and how and why it makes sense. So let's talk for a moment a little bit about logistic growth. Uh, logistic growth occurs when new populations stabilize as a result of environmental resistance. So what we're talking about here is carrying capacity. When a population size increases to a certain number, the factors begin to set in that, re that caps the population at a particular size so that you can't go far outpace yourself, all right? So we're talking about this, 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 this curve right here at this level where it stabilizes. Now, let's, uh, I wanna show you an animation. So let, let, this particular animation is uh, from your publisher, from the textbook, that shows you how all of these different things come into play, including uh, the formula that I had introduced you at the beginning of this particular unit. So just hang on in there. Let me just show you how this actually works. So here is the video. Let me play it for you. The growth of a population, the change in its size over time, is determined by four factors. Births add individuals to the population, increasing its number, while deaths subtract individuals, causing the population to shrink. Similarly, immigration of individuals into a population causes positive population growth whereas emigration of individuals out of a population causes negative population growth. This relationship is summarized as follows. Change in population size equals births minus deaths plus immigrants minus emigrants. In our analysis, we will examine closed populations, which means that we will ignore the roles of immigration and emigration. Now let's examine how population growth is a function of birth rate, death rate, and population size. The birth rate, B, is the number of births over a period of time divided by the number of individuals in the population at the start of that period. For example, if there are 10,000 individuals in the population and 1,500 births in a year, the per capita birth rate for that year is 1,500 divided by 10,000 which equals 0.15. Similarly, the death rate, D, is the number of deaths over a period of time divided by the number of individuals in the population, say 500 divided by 10,000, which equals 0.05. If we combine the birth and death rates, we can calculate the growth rate, designated R, using the equation R equals B minus D. In this example, the growth rate is equal to the birth rate of 0.15 minus the death rate of 0.05 or 0.10, a net growth rate of 10% per year. Within populations, R varies over time. If the birth rate and death rate are equal, R equals zero, and the population remains the same size. If the birth rate is higher than the death rate, R is positive and the population is growing. If the birth rate is lower than the death rate, R is negative and the population is shrinking. Now let's use the concept of the growth rate to predict population growth. Population growth can be calculated by multiplying the growth rate, R, times the size of the population, N. Let's plug in some numbers. If R is 0.04 per year, and the population at the beginning of the year consists of 2,000 individuals, then the population grows by 80 individuals in that year. When R does not change over time, this equation describes exponential growth. Exponential growth is a pattern of a continuously accelerating increase in population size. Let's contrast two populations growing exponentially. The first is a low growth population in which R equals 0.02. At time zero, the population has 20 members, indicated by N, and then the population grows at a constant growth rate, R, of 0.02. Notice that the larger the population gets, the more individuals it adds each year. This growth pattern produces a J-shaped curve 
that is characteristic of exponentially growing populations. A population that is growing exponentially adds an increasing number of individuals during each succeeding time period. Exponential growth is most characteristic of young populations or populations with an abundance of resources. At a growth rate of 0.04, a population grows dramatically faster. For example, at a time of 200 years, the population in which R equals 0.02 has about 1,000 individuals, whereas the one in which R equals 0.04 has nearly 60,000. Even small differences in the growth rate can have huge effects on exponentially growing populations. In nature, exponential growth cannot continue forever. A small population may have enough resources to grow rapidly at first, but as individuals begin to compete for resources, population growth typically slows. In this model called logistic growth, the population levels off at the environment's carrying capacity. The environment has enough resources to sustain this hypothetical population at 100,000 individuals. Let's compare the equations for exponential growth and logistic growth. In logistic growth, the symbol K represents the carrying capacity, the maximum number of individuals in a population that can be supported in a particular habitat over a sustained period of time. If K is 100 individuals and the population already has an N value of 50 individuals, then the value for K minus N is a positive number meaning that the population should continue to grow. However, if n is already larger than k, we would get a negative number, and we would expect the population to shrink. Consider another aspect of this equation. k minus n divided by k represents the proportion of unused resources in a habitat. If k and n have similar values, for example, 199 respectively, then the proportion of unused resources would be 1 over 100. The available resources are relatively meager, and the population would be expected to grow slowly or not at all. However, if K and N have values that are far apart, such as 110 respectively, then the proportion of unused resources would be 90 over 100. Most of the resources are still available, and the population would be expected to grow relatively quickly. Select an initial starting size indicated by N0 and a growth rate, R, for an exponentially growing population. To see a similar population under logistic growth, select a value for the environment's carrying capacity, K. Click a number below the respective boxes, then click the plot button. So what I have just shown you um, is a video clip that comes from a uh, web publisher, which is coming from the textbook that we are using right now. And uh, unfortunately, I cannot send that as a separate link. So I hope that the volume and the visual effect, um, it's good and, and user friendly for you. So let's take a look at this graph for a moment. All right. What this is showing you here are uh, four different, are, are um, three different lines that is showing you what happens to a population when it far exceeds a carrying capacity represented by the red line where the population size completely booms and, and plummets. And then it represented in the blue line is a population size that increases and beyond carrying capacity, but not as high as the, uh, as the red line did, but then it also plummets. Um, so it goes through the boom cycle as well. However, it is able to recover to such a point, uh, but the recovery um, uh, far, goes far, far below the carrying capacity because there was a significant damage that was done to perhaps the local environments um, or the land masses such that it can no longer sustain the same carrying capacity as it did prior to having this significant increase in population. Now the line represented in green is a more moderate change where the carrying capacity was um, uh, the population size uh, reached and overshoot slightly the carrying capacity, but overall it is able to sustain it and you see that this is a fluctuation. And this is actually much more representative of what you would see in real life. And that is uh, the population can overshoot carrying capacity slightly, but then the population size will then be reduced 
and then it can be increased again over time because you're giving it a chance whenever the population size reduces for the environment to recover whatever the problem may be or have the problem be fixed before population size um, goes up again. So now, here is one of those examples of real life scenarios that you may read about or come across in a testing situation. This is a famous study that was, that was done on reindeer um, that was living on the Pribilof Islands in the Bering Sea. They, uh, they were, uh, that when, what started off is that there were a very, very tiny population of reindeer population that was dropped off in this uh, environment, they had no natural predators there. And after when the deers were living there, the, pop, the scientists tracked them over a span of um, uh, uh, 25 years to see what would happen. Now, what you see in here are some of the uh, data points that at the very early on, they were only about 25 reindeer, um, of which there were only about four of them uh, that were males and 21 of them were females. Now, a starting uh, ratio where male and females are so different. Now, even though these animals may copulate with more than one, uh, you still have to do it one at a time. So the, the rate, the fact that there are so few males in a population where there's only four, um, what it does is that it limits the, um, the time it takes. Uh, it, it long, or you, another way to express it is that it takes a much longer time for the male to get through all of the female population to, um, to uh, impregnate them so that they can expand the population. So what you're seeing here is that at the beginning of the study, when they looked at these animals, um, the growth rate is actually very slow, right? They're growing, they're growing, they're growing, but they came into a problem, um, whatever that may be in the natural environment that it is, that it is in, and then the population adjusted itself and it started to climb again. But remember, when the population size get to a certain point, right? And they all begin to reproduce because you're dealing with a larger population to begin with, when they all choose to reproduce and if they're able to produce viable offsprings, then the population size will be growing at a much faster rate. Now, essentially what happened was this particular population uh, reached a very high point, all right? And then what happens is population size begin to drop and plummet, going through the boom cycle until eventually it completely crashed, uh, where these reindeer uh, completely destroyed the island itself, where it was feeding off um, the, plant the, the plantations that were there. And because they were no natural predator, um, these animals have nothing that to keep the population size in check, which is definitely not healthy. This is a more realistic uh, scenario of barnacles. Uh, this is a real life logistic curve of barnacles in nature, where you see the beginning of the population uh, rising stead slowly and steadily. Um, over time, it will um, grow exponent. It can grow really high, but then ultimately, you see there's lines. It's a more like a zigzag line that goes up and down because it has reached its carrying capacity that hovers somewhere around in the mid 70, uh, 70 uh, um, barnacles per centimeter square, uh, which is what limits the population size over time, all right? So what are some factors that can regulate population size? It turns out there are two different factors. One type is called the density independent factors that can limit population regardless of population density. And I'll give you examples of both of these. The second one is called density dependent factors that can increase ineffectiveness as a population density increases itself. So let's take a look at each one of these. By density independent factor, what we're referring to are climate patterns, temperature changes, right? It doesn't matter how densely populated or sparsely populated you are. When the seasons change, especially with freezing temperatures, or when you have um, 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 an intense high temperatures that come in like heat waves, you will threaten the survival and population size of many different kinds of insects and annual plant uh, populations. Um, for example, most of the plants that we know of that are not evergreens, um, they will not be able to surpass some of the seasons. Um, they will actually have to go into um, what we call a dormancy stage, where we'll talk, into, we'll talk about in just a moment. Natural catastrophes, such as hurricanes, droughts, floods, and fire, will have a profound effect on population size, uh, regardless of their density, right? So that, this is what we're referring to. Other things that are also density independent factors include us, 
human activities. The fact that we use pesticides and imposing pollutants into a natural environment to control the living environment that we're in. Hunting, overhunting in particular, where we drive particular species and threaten their survival is one of those examples. Um, habitat destruction because of urbanization, deforestation, um, is, is another one of these problems that it doesn't matter how large the original population size of other species are, we can drive them and threaten them um, to a critical numbers. For example, the ivory-billed woodpecker, as you see in this particular photo, um, the last time uh, where the sighting occurred was in um, Louisiana in 1944. And this particular organism is at, critic, at critical numbers. Uh, there has been numerous sightings that some people claim they have seen, but it's not confirmed by experts or scientists that are trying to track and find some of these animals. Um, we, it, it's uncertain whether these animals are, has been completely been driven into extinction because of um, the, the way in which humans have destroyed their natural habitat. Um, however, it is unsure because the numbers are so small and it's so difficult to observe these animals in the wild. All right, so um, how do organisms overcome uh, these uh, density independent factors? Um, in order for them to enhance the survival? Well, one of these things is adaptation, right? Um, some of the animals have very thick coats and, and fat layers to survive wintertime, such as polar bears, as we know it. They also go into hibernation, as a lot of the black bears and brown bears do, all right? There's also migrations that birds would implement um, in, so when the temperature begins to drop in our environment, such as the fall season, a lot of birds will begin to migrate to warmer climate areas so that they can find food and more hospitable environments. One of the things in which our trees do, and we all know this, is that they tend to drop their leaves, in particular those that live in the uh, temperate deciduous forest environment, so that they can preserve uh, the root systems and stems that are inside the plant without causing severe damage uh, to, the interior, to the interior plant structures and by dropping a lot of the leaves and also by not flowering during this period of time where um, it is difficult to get enough sunlight, to have access to uh, free flowing water, all right? So they, they use this as a way of adaptation. Now, here's another example. Um, what you're seeing here are red bell peppers that we would fine in a regular supermarket. Uh, these two photos happens to be photos that I have taken from my own home because I've been germinating some of these. So I literally cut open one of these bell peppers and I germinated them. But the reality is, if this particular bell pepper were to be found, say, in the wild, and these seeds were dropped into the soil during wintertime, you will not find these germination to occur. As a matter of fact, if you read the instructions on some of these uh, veg vegetable growing packets, they will tell you, um, you have to cover these seeds, maintain in a wet environment, using paper towel, which was, which was exactly what I did. Um, um, I keep it covered inside a box, away from direct sunlight, um, and then I let it sit for, um, for a week or so uh, until the little roots begin to germinate and pop out. And then afterwards, I would plot them, I would uh, plant them into um, my uh, little germination tray filled with uh, it's, uh, some of the soil until it grows to a certain number of leaves before I transplant them. But the reality is, in order for seed to germinate, you have to get them out of the dormancy period. How do you do that? By providing it uh, with the temperature that it needs, which is usually what people do is we keep them indoor when we're germinating seeds, all right? Or you give them really heated soil, which is what some people would produce in their basement if they don't have a garden or a terrace where they can set this in. Um, and another thing that they, you would have to do is to provide it with a lot of light. After when the seed germination process is over, you want them to be able to perform photosynthesis. All of these are special, special adaptations in order for population size to grow over time. So what about density dependent factors? Well, these uh, has to do with availability of food, how many predators are around, if they are present at all, and how abundant are they, um, diseases. Are there major diseases that can devastate an entire population size where they are all vulnerable to? And migration patterns, is that allowed? Is there access to migration? Or has that been cut off because of barriers that has been set into place? So 
why are why are density dependent factors important? They're important because it exerts a negative feedback effect on population size, meaning it helps to regulate and prevent population over uh, or uh, overpopulation or explosion from occurring, all right? Uh, for example, by the, the fact that we have predators available uh, for some of these wild animals, it helps to take out some of the weakened prey. So organisms that tend to be weaker um, or organisms that are, are not strong enough, they will be some of the first ones to be eliminated from the gene pool, allowing those that are best adapted to survive and carry on to pass on their traits. Um, the predator populations um, often tend to increase when the prey population is abundant. So there's actually a dual regulation effect that can, that can happen here. Um, because what you, what you see, especially in some of the, uh, the graphing activity that I have already given you, right? Um, it exhibits a lot like this, what I'm showing here, which is the blue line that represents the prey that's being hunted. And the red line represents the predator. Now, you will notice often is that as the predator population increases, the prey population decreases at the same time, almost at the same time, or just with a slight lag. Why? Because the predator is going after the prey. You eat them and you kill them. So the population size decreases. When the population size of a prey decreases significantly, you would also expect a drop in prey in predator population because they will have a harder time finding their prey. And but then as the prey population rises to a high level, and they're much easier to track. And so therefore you can also anticipate uh, shortly thereafter, you will have the predator population that will also catch up and increase in their population, which then drives the prey population to go down. So this is a um, constant cyclic, cyclical cycle where both predator and prey populations can help limit each other's population size. But what's great about it is that it helps to sustain the natural environment that they're both living in so that neither one of these populations can destroy the environment um, as quickly because of the surge in, in the numbers that you may find. Well, what about parasites? Well, parasites, interestingly enough, can do have a similar effect in that they weaken their host by making them much more susceptible to diseases um, or um, um, harsh weather conditions, uh, such as what predators will do. Now, um, they also weaken the host's capability to reproduce as well. What you see on this slide are various examples of parasites, such as those that cause malaria, African sleeping sickness, um, uh, giardia, that causes severe diarrhea, tapeworm that lives inside of us, um, uh, Chagres disease, all right, the kissing bug. Um, all of these things can weaken or slow down the population growth over time. Now, how does competition influence population size over time? Well, when there's an increase in population, depending upon whether um, two different groups have very similar needs, that can drive up the, pop, the competition between them. If it's between two different species, we call that inter-specific competition. If it's within the same species, we would call that intra-specific competition. Now within intra-specific competition, we can further break it down into two subtypes. One type is called scramble competition, where um, all of these organisms, because they have the same needs, they will then be competing for the same availability of food source, mates, and habitat environment. They also would engage in what we call contest competition, where they would use various types of social or chemical cues um, that would determine how successful they would be in getting a hold of the important resources that they're, really, that they're looking for, all right? So the bottom line is that only those individuals that are best adapted within a given population will be able to get sufficient amount of food and shelter in order for them to survive, mate, and pass on their genes. And those that cannot, if immigration is an option, they can migrate to another area or go to an, um, uh, a terrain where some of their own species have not encroached or are not living in yet so that they can perhaps become the founders of this new environment. Um, but of course, uh, the environmental challenge um, 
the environmental challenges are present, just like you have learned it in the uh, topic in evolution that we have talked about. All right, so this is the end of the first half of this lecture on chapter 26. I hope that some of these concepts would seem familiar to you, in part, um, because the graphing activity that I have sent you uh, at the beginning of this week may have already gotten you to start thinking about um, what the study of ecology is all about and how a lot of this tracking of population size growth over time, it's actually being conducted and monitored by scientists. Well, I will be uh, sending you the second half of this lecture shortly. Um, and I look forward to uh, hearing, having any questions that you may have encountered from the uh, activity. If you, if you have any of them, feel free to email me. All right, take care and uh, have a good week. Take care, bye-bye.